Verse 12. And Okay, so let's go through these descriptions here. And had a wall great and high. So New Jerusalem has walls, okay? It's great and high, big and tall, and had 12 gates. It'll have 12 gates, and at the gates, 12 angels. There are 12 angels. So basically, one angel per gate. That's how it works. And names written thereon. There are names written on each of these gates. What kind of names? Which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. So the 12 tribes of the children of Israel are written on each of these gates over here. So if we look at a more closer inspection inside New Jerusalem over here, a closer inspection will be that there are walls and gates. And these gates actually are 12 of them in number and each of them guarded by an angel, so to speak. So each angel over here is going to take is going to take guard of each gate. Makes you kind of wonder why the Catholic Church, they would put uh, images of angels on top of their buildings, right? Or their gates. Ever thought about that one? Where did that come from? Word of God is always ahead. Word of God is always ahead. There's going to be an angel uh, that will be standing guard of these gates. And each gate, so there's 12 in number. Now you want to remember this, all right? Because I'm going to show you a really deep doctrine, which is going to be pretty interesting. It's going to be one of the deepest doctrines that I taught in Revelation. So it's going to be interesting. So there are 12 in number gates that go with the each tribe of the children of Israel, all right? So there's going to be Judah, Dan, etc., and etc. So that's how it's going to work over there. Um, actually, I kind of messed up. I was supposed to bring my commentary with me. Um, if, uh, uh, brother, can you get me uh, my Revelation commentary from my bag? It might be, be it's going to be behind the pulpit. So, if, yeah, so thank you. Because I have to read you something over there real soon. Okay, but anyway, each gate is going to go with each tribe in Israel. So, verse 13, on the east, three gates. On the north, uh, three gates. On the south, three gates. And on the west, three gates. That's self-explanatory, right? So, basically, north, south, east, and west of New Jerusalem... There's going to be three gates each, okay? So there are three gates on each side. Now, let's keep reading here. Verse 14, and the wall of the city had 12 foundations. So this city that has walls, it's going to have 12 foundations. And in them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. So each foundation consists of each apostle's name. So the walls of the city are going to have twelve in number over here. So I don't know if that's twelve, but basically... If there are going to be 12 foundations upon these walls over here, it's going to consist of each apostle's name. Now, I'm going to give you a little bit of a memory over here. A reminder is, remember uh, at Revelation chapter 5, and four, we're trying to identify the 24 elders, right? These 24 elders, uh, we supposed it to be that they could be representations of the Jews, Old Testament Jews, and then the Christian church who are up in heaven away from the tribulations. Because mm -hmm. uh, remember, each uh, apostle and tribe, when you look up the number 24 in the Bible, it actually uh, means a representative of a group, of an entire group. 
And we looked at Revelation 4 and 5, the 24 elders are actually representing groups of people from all around the world of all time. So we looked at that before. And then the best answer that we could find, we're not saying it's the right answer. I don't know what the right answer is, but the best answer that fits could be 12 apostles and 12 tribes of Israel because each of them represents something. 12 tribes of Israel represent the Old Testament Jews. 12 apostles representing the church, so to speak. So that could be the representation over there. Now what's also interesting over here is that each foundation has each apostle's name. Verse 15, he that talked with me, okay, that's one of the seven angels, rem remember, who talked with John, had a golden reed to measure the city. So a reed is it's kind of like a measuring stick, so to speak, that they used uh, to measure. And it's a golden reed at that. To measure the city. So they used a golden reed to measure the city. And the gates thereof. They used it to measure the gates as well. And the wall thereof. They used it to measure the walls as well. And the city lieth four square. Alright, so the city where it's lying, it's laying out as four square. Whatever that is, right? So four square... That is actually probably one of the, I don't know if I ever did this in my other Revelation studies, but this is the only thing that I'll ever say in my Revelation study that I have to say I don't know, to be honest. A lot of the other things I would give theories on, but this one I can't even give a theory. I do not know what this is. Um, what I do know is this, though, is that when you look up the term four square, it would refer to all four sides of a square. Sometimes that's, uh, that's what the definition is. So then if you're looking for a perfect measurement for that one, it would be like a cube, so to speak. However, Dr. Ruckman, he does it differently. He, he draws it like a double pyramid. And I went through that thing backwards and forwards, and I don't know how he came up with that logic. That's all I'll say. Yeah, sometimes that, uh, the man's mind runs very deep. That it takes a lot, because uh, he talks... A lot of times what you got to understand about Dr. Upman's character is whatever information he knows on his head, he'll just spit it out. So if he thinks of something really deep, if it pops out in his head, he'll spit it out actually. So a lot of people, they think that he's just uh, old and crazy, but look, I, you don't really know the guy. A lot of the times when I dug up and took time on some of his crazy statements, I realized, dude, uh, this was way ahead of us actually. And there were verses, and you have to take time, years actually, to finally discover it. A lot of things that he taught, it took me years actually. Some of them I didn't agree or believe either. But instead of criticizing, I just put on on a shelf. And that's very good advice. Very good advice is this, is that uh, with, with a pastor that teaches you something, don't easily disagree or criticize easily. The best advice is to put it on a shelf, and trust me, in time you'll understand why the pastor taught it that way, or did things that way in church. That's very good advice, trust me. If you've been a member for more than 10 years or 20 years, you know that advice is true. Because sometimes when you have a disagreement with the pastor and then you just kept it quiet, later on you found out, oh, I see why he did that. So I'm glad I didn't open my, my mouth about it and cause more trouble in the church, right? So it's best to, so that's very good advice. Unless it's plain sin and plain heresy, that's where we draw the line, obviously. But if it's not, don't get so critical in minute details, especially with the, with the city being four square, okay, for crying out loud. You don't have to make a big deal out, about that one. I can tell you some thoughts in my head. So I do know this, though, about if we're going to support a, a double-shaped pyramid. One thing is this. One thing I know for a matter of fact is that the universe is shaped in, is, the shape of the universe is actually in a pyramid form. And I taught that in the Bible. All of creation is the imprint of God, of the Godhead actually. God the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, which can show a triangular pattern actually. Another thing also is that um, I find it interesting that at the back of the dollar bill, that the Illuminati, where they want to achieve enlightenment or their heavenly bliss, so to speak, they would use a pyramid and the top of the pyramid at that. So it would make a lot of sense that God's blissful heaven would be a, heaven, uh, would be a pyramid shape, so to speak. 
Not only that, the sons of God, a lot of them who are involved with uh, making the pyramids, why did they do that? Because like Lucifer, I want to be like the Most High. I will ascend above the stars. They tried to make their own heaven on earth. So that's the reason. So I can see why it would be a pyramid uh, shape over there. As far as double pyramid is concerned, uh, Dr. Upman words it as it's squared four times when you do that because of the base of the pyramid, so to speak. But still, that's like a little bit too deep for me. I just need some time. As the hymn goes, take time to be holy, right? There's one hymn that sings that way. So I just need to take a little bit more time on that one. All right. Uh, now, here's the interesting part you want to know, okay? It says over here that uh, in the middle of verse 16, that when he measured the city with the reed, it's 12,000 furlongs, okay? So 12,000 furlongs, how it's estimated to be, is that basically there are eight furlongs to a mile. That's how the measurement goes. One mile equals eight furlongs. So then if you use that 12,000 furlongs, approximately the city is 1,500 miles long. But it's not just long. If you keep reading over here, it says at the middle of verse 16, the length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. So it's not just the length of it, it's also the width and the height everywhere. And they're all equal. That could also be a supporting factor uh, to a pyramid, so to speak, actually, those measurements. But that's, as, uh, but that's as far as I could go a little bit more on that one. But anyway, returning to the topic at hand, you got to realize then, then that means it's 1,500 miles long, wide, and high. Do you realize how massive this city would be? A lot of people, they think that you can't, how are you going to fit all saved believers in this new Jerusalem? Look, look at, look, man, this is plenty of space over here because it's not just length, it's height and breadth. The reason why you think we're overpopulated is because you're only looking at the width of the situation, the length. You're not looking at the height of it as well. This is humongous. This is humongous. And not only that, where we're talking about overpopulation, trouble with overpopulation, you got to realize this, there's plenty of space in the ocean, actually, that made up the majority of the space, as well as uh, empty desert and terrains. But if you fill those out with population and paradise and cities, then there's more room. See that? But anyway, if we were to count this, Dr. Ruckman, he words it out this way. That works, uh, that works out to... 40,144,896,000 square feet. If you were to lay it down on North America, it would stretch from Miami, Florida to Montreal, Canada and from Washington, D.C. to Denver, Colorado. You could put all 6 billion people living on Earth today in that area and give them each an acre of land with a ranch-style house, a yard, a garden and a pond. But if you add the height, if you add the height to the calculations, you get a total volume of 500 quintillion cubic feet in the city. A quintillion is one with 18 zeros behind it. Even if you allowed for 8 billion Christians living in the city, that's 4 million a year for 2,000 years who got saved, all right? And that's a very generous estimate, okay? You could give each one of them a house of 100,000 cubic feet. The average home has 10,000 cubic feet. So if that's not a mansion, I don't know what is. <laughs> and still have nearly 50 quintillion cubic feet left for parks, lakes, plazas, the throne of God, the river of life, and a large forest of the tree of life. You have to admit that's some city. Amen. Yeah, no kidding, right? <laughs> All right, let's keep reading here. And he measured the wall thereof. So now he's measuring the wall over here at New Jerusalem. And 144 cubits. So it's uh, 144 cubits. Now, what is a cubit? Cubit is usually where they say right here, according to the measure of a man at verse 17. That's the idea because they use the forearm of a man to the fingertip, so to speak. So that's how long a cubit uh, a cubit is actually. 
So it's 144 cubits. Now, I don't know if that has to do with the 144,000. I don't know if it has any relation to that, but it might be. It might be. Because remember, the gates have the 12 tribes of Israel mentioned, right? And then God at Revelation chapter 7, he was numbering the, each individual from the 12 tribes of Israel. So uh, if he did that in that sense, maybe there's a reason why for that. There's a reason why for that. Because remember, uh, the wall at verse 12 had 12 gates. See that? The wall consisted of the, the tribe of Israel, so to speak. And then if you go to verse 17, that same wall, it wouldn't be far-fetched to say that the 144,000 Jews, they play a part with the tribes of Israel there. But I don't know, okay? You can dig a little further on that one. Now, notice that the cubit is according to the measure of a man. That's how you can tell the measurement of a cubit. It's according to the measure of a man. But look at the last part here. That is of the what at verse 17? Measure of a man, that is of the what? Angel. That proves angels are likened to men. That is the plainest verse in your scripture. That angels do not have wings... And angels are not females. They are males. They are males. As a matter of fact, what is intensely interesting is that if you look at a lot of these other uh, scholars' commentaries, some of them are saying that the angel may not be, uh, may, they may not be feet and feet, feet tall. They might be the normal height of a man, measure of a man, which is intensely interesting. So the vision that Muhammad saw may be a fairy tale that he made up. I saw this humongous angel with a hundred something wings and etc. Might be a fairy tale, see? Think about that one for a while. All right, let's go back to verse 18. The building of the wall of it was of jasper. So the way they built this wall was all jasper, diamond, so to speak. And the city was pure gold. So the wall is all diamond, jasper. The city inside, pure gold like unto clear glass. It is like clear glass, this gold. You ever seen gold that you can see it transparently? That's pure gold right there. Real pure. Verse 19, the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished. Now look at this. The foundations are the apostles, right? The foundations for this wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. It's decorated with all sorts of precious stones. Now, this is where it gets interesting here. If you read verses 19 through 20, it mentions each precious stone here, and there are 12 of them in number. If you were to think about the book of Leviticus, about the breastplate for the tribes of Israel, they did the same thing as well, actually. They did the same thing as well. So, is there then a connection with the apostles, with the tribes of Israel then? Because the tribes of Israel also had these 12 stones on the breastplate. But these stones are connected to the apostles. Go to Matthew 19. Matthew 19. Is there a connection with the apostles and the tribes? Yeah. Which makes, which maybe then, which maybe supports the idea why God combines this, uh, 12 apostles with the 12 tribes into a total number, conglomerated wholesome number of 24 elders. It makes you think about that. All right, go to Matthew chapter 19, verse 28. What does Jesus say to the 12 disciples? Verse 28. And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me, in the regeneration when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, Right? The glory on his throne, New Jerusalem, right? Like that one, for example. Ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the what? Twelve tribes of Israel. Wow, wow, wow. Okay, go back. So these apostles are going to be assimilated with these tribes of Israel. Now, here's the next thing that I don't know, actually. So you're actually at the best revelation study where... I actually say I don't know a lot. This is actually deep doctrine. I want to encourage people to research it themselves, actually. This will be a lot of fun for you guys if you start researching this yourselves. 
about the four square and these stones. All right, so Dr. Uckman, he has it this way, okay? But let's read the verses, and then we're going to mention, he's going to mention how each stone matches with each tribe, and then uh, what the stones are like. Verse 19, the first foundation was Jasper. So he has Jasper here as the first foundation. The second, Sapphire. The third, a Chalcedony. The fourth, an Emerald. The fifth, Sardonyx. The sixth, Sardius. The seventh, Chrysolite. The eighth, Beryl. The ninth, a Topaz. The tenth, a Chrysopresus. The eleventh, a Jacinth. The twelfth, an Amethyst. Okay, so Dr. Ruckman, he mentions about uh, 12 stones as follows, which is uh, pretty interesting. He says, Emerald, a green stone that symbolizes Judah. It is found in South America and Mexico. Cortez fell through jealousy, jealousy over an emerald he gave his wife. Hence, green with envy. Right, that? Yeah. Uh, sapphire, a blue stone which symbolizes Simeon. It is a pebble in Ceylon and found in mass in North Carolina, Persia, and Wales. Sardonyx, a red and white stone which symbolizes Dan. It is often called the onyx stone. Chalcedony, a white translucent stone which symbolizes Levi. It is also sometimes called the onyx stone and is found in Iceland and the New Hebrides Islands. Topaz, a light yellow orange stone which symbolizes Issachar. It is found on an island in the Red Sea. Chrysolite, a gold stone that symbolizes Gad. It is so brilliant that one found in the 14th century shone through cloth. Beryl, a stone like frozen fire, which symbolizes Asher. Sardius, a brownish red stone that symbolizes Naphtali. Jacinth, a dusky red stone that symbolizes Joseph. Number 10, Amethyst. A light purple crystal that symbolizes Benjamin. Number 11, Chrysoprestus, a golden green stone that symbolizes Zebulun. Number 12, Jasper, a transparent crystal that symbolizes Reuben. So I don't know how he matches all of that. The only thing that I can think of is that if you were to study the book of Exodus and Leviticus, each stone, and then also you look at Jacob's prophecy of each tribe at the book of Genesis, probably chapter 49, I forgot. But perhaps those descriptions can match each emerald. And if you study each mineral stone, their history and their origins, it might match with the prophecy of how Jacob uh, ordained each of his sons. That's my best guess. But uh, look it up, all right?